Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming down to the Downtown Library this evening. Welcome to the Edmonton Public Library. I am Valerie McNiven, and I'm part of a group called the... Are you hearing me okay? It sounds like I'm in a nope. bottle up here. Nope. Anyway, <laughs> odd, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I am part of a group here at the library called the Aboriginal Services Team, and we are delighted to welcome author Pam Palmader. Did I say that right? Yeah. Oh, my, great. Um, who is currently on a book tour across Canada promoting her book, Beyond Blood, Rethinking Indigenous Identity. Uh, Pam is Mi'kmaq, mother of two boys from the eastern part of Mi'kma'ki, Mi New Brunswick, <laughs> and her family hails from northern New Brunswick, where her great-grandfather, Louis Jerome, was one of the first chiefs. It is her personal career goal um, to work on indigenous issues and nation building until we have achieved healthy, sustainable communities supported by strong, vibrant indigenous nations that are inclusive of all their rightful citizens, which is the topic Pam will be talking about tonight. Um, pa Pam has a doctorate in the science of law from Dalhousie University and is an associate professor and chair of Ryerson University's Centre for Indigenous Governance in Toronto. We are thrilled that uh, Pam has agreed to visit us and share her work, so please welcome me. And please welcome Pam Palmeter. <laughs> Thank you. microphone sounds weird if you'd rather me project my voice or talk into the bottle it's up to you do you need it for recording yeah I would stick with the microphone oh okay the all right aren't very good especially with the open space behind oh, so okay don't mind all right no problem so um, yeah if I sound funny it's not my fault <laughs> and it's not because I'm from the Maritimes either <laughs> you blame any accent on the microphone um, thank you all for having me here and hosting me um, I, I have to acknowledge the traditional territories of all the indigenous people that are here. I come from Mi'kma'k, um, that's the Mi'kmaq ta uh, nation territory in the Maritimes which comprises most of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, Newfoundland, parts of Quebec and parts of Maine. So we have a pretty huge territory and um, we always consider it an honor when we can go to uh, our different relations and, and be on their territory. Um, so this is a really important issue to me. Uh, I'm, I'm less going around the country promoting my book than I am promoting help on addressing the issue. So the issue really deals with how the federal government controls indigenous identity under the Indian Act. That's primarily what my book addressed. And it also addressed sub-issues like band membership and how that's separate from status under the Indian Act and then self-government citizenship treaty beneficiary status, land claim beneficiary status. These are all very separate categories that impact Indigenous identity. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with what status is, uh, under the Indian Act, the federal government has assumed uh, control over deciding who is considered an Indian, that's the legislative term, um, and they do that by several categories under section six and seven. Um, they're not based on culture, ancestry, language, history, community, or anything that's associated with an actual identity. It's all determined based on who you married, when you married them, if you, uh, you know, noted your children on birth certificates, if you noted the father. Uh, you don't even have to be Aboriginal to be a status Indian in Canada. So the terminology that I use, not meant to offend anybody, it's uh, the terminology that's under the Indian Act. Registration under the Indian Act is either referred to as registration or Indian status. Sometimes people refer to it as treaty status, but it's all referring to the same thing. So my book uh, is basically six or seven years of research on all of the legislative amendments over time of the Indian Act, both pre-Confederation and post-Confederation. So there have been lots of amendments very little in the way of determining who's an Indian and who isn't. Um, it, it was also looking at all of the band membership codes in Canada. The majority of bands have their membership determined by Indian Affairs. They don't control their own membership. And also self-government citizenship codes. And the reason why I looked at those codes is because it's often um, characterized as the solution. So the Indian Act isn't working. There's some problems with band membership codes, so self-government is seen as the solution. 
But what I found is that the self-government codes are written almost identical to what the Indian Act uh, has. So where do we go from here? Both as uh, Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people, we all have a role to play in kind of uh, bringing about change in this area. So I always kind of go ahead of my slides. You'll have to excuse me. One, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> So I'm, I'm not very methodical, I'm kind of mixed up in the head. And, and two, I'm a professor, so I tend to treat it like a class and completely ignore my slides. So if I do that, just kind of jump up and down or something. But these slides are less, um, less of a lecture, but more of a visual kind of way of understanding the issues that I'm going to be talking about. Because if I stood up here and started quoting section this, section that, section this, you would all fall asleep. And it's Friday night, so I'm assuming you're all going out after this presentation. Um, the major issue for, for me, and one of the reasons why I, I wrote this book, is because it's true, the, the Indian Act is very oppressive, it's anachronistic, it's outdated, uh, it's been determined to be discriminatory by numerous courts. That's one issue. The other issue is how deeply our communities, some of our communities, have internalized that kind of thinking. So obviously, um, 200, 300, 400 years ago, we were determining our own identity, our own cultures, our own relations with individuals, families, communities, and nations in a very specific way, always relational, relational to the environment, relational to our ancestors, uh, relational to the creator, and to one another. It had nothing to do with someone else deciding who we were. So the Mi'kmaq never went to the Mohawks and said, yo, this is how Mohawks are. That, that would have resulted in a war. Um, the other issue is, in terms of that internal colonization, we now have individuals who both identify as a status Indian or a non-status Indian, someone who lives on reserve or off reserve, but judge others by whether they're registered under the Indian Act, what kind of registration they have. So, Part of the complexity that I'll deal with here tonight is that you're not even just a status Indian. You're a 6-1, a 6-1-A, a 6-1-B, a 6-1-C, D, E, F, or a 6-2 Indian. And now there's a new section, a section 6-1-C-1. I mean, there's just so many sections to keep up with. And it's really a form of differenti differentiated citizenship because there's different rights that go with each. And that's all been superimposed on our traditional notions of what it means to be an indigenous person, a Mi'kmaq person, a Maliseet person. And so part of our decolonization, not just addressing that, you know, Canada has done something under the Indian Act, but now we are impacted. We have, we have internalized some of that. How do we get out of that and return back to our traditional forms of indigeneity, which is much more reflective, which is much more in harmony with uh, our, our culture? And so, of course, my, my major goal is to help inform communities. So I'm going around mostly talking to First Nation communities, Aboriginal organizations, um, some homeless shelters, women's shelters, anywhere where there's people who want to know about this issue. Where did all of these concepts come from? Because we didn't create it. We had no input into it. So, and, and the other aspect is also informing the public. So what can all the non-Indigenous people do? What Canadian citizens, what can they do? Why should it matter to them? It's not just an issue that impacts First Nations or Métis people or Inuit people, but it really is uh, a reflection of who we are as Canadians and whether or not we consider our Indigenous peoples part of that, part of that uh, nationality, part of that uh, citizenship uh, camaraderie. I am not the first person, oh, here's the first incompatibility. The picture doesn't show up. Okay, so I'm not the first person to do this. Uh, Status under the Indian Act has been a problem for you know, many, many decades. And there have been many Indigenous women before me talking about this issue, trying to bring about change. Mary Two Acts Early was one of the very first ones. Part of the problem was when she married a non-Indian, under the Indian Act, she lost her Indian status. What does that mean? It meant that she also lost her band membership and couldn't live on the reserve couldn't be part of her community, couldn't have access to her, her elders and her culture and, and her territory. And so she said, there's something wrong with this process. Why does this only happen to indigenous women? 
So first of all, should you lose your identity by marrying someone? And if so, why would it only impact Indigenous women? Why were these amendments even brought into the Indian Act to begin with? And part of the, part of the issue is that there were colonial assumptions when they were designing Indian policy. Very problematic assumptions. One, that Indigenous people were inferior. We, we know about that. We've heard about that in our cap. We see it in historical documents, in the records of government. And two, that Indians were only a temporary problem. This has been an underlying assumption of Indian policy for a very long time. The assumption was, both in Canada and the United States, Australia and New Zealand, was that the Indigenous populations would soon be dying off. So any policies or laws that were created weren't meant for the long term. They were meant for the very short term. That policy assumption has never really been adjusted to accommodate for the fact that we are still here, we have high birth rates, we're growing in numbers, uh, we're, we're decolonizing, we're healing, we're becoming stronger and stronger. So how do, you, how do you match those two incompatible assumptions? So although she was discriminated against in her community, she was uh, not allowed to be a part of her community, she still advocated for change. So it wasn't a matter of, this is unfair, this has affected me negatively, that's really awful. She went around the country, she went around the world telling everybody who would listen that this was gender discrimination and moreover that it was discrimination against uh, Indigenous peoples overall. And so she was one of the very first act, uh, activists to talk about this. Oh, the picture works. So uh, Jeanette Corbière Laval was one of the first Indigenous women to actually take Canada to court. Some of you may know her. She's the current president of the Native Women's Association of Canada. So she is still fighting on behalf of Indigenous women um, on this issue. So she took Canada to court to say, losing my status because I married a non-Indian, that's just wrong. It's gender discrimination. Uh, set aside the fact that Canada is the one who's making the decision. And she lost. The Supreme Court, even though at the time there was something called the Bill of Rights, which guaranteed male and female equality, the Supreme Court of Canada said that even though there's an equality provision in the Bill of Rights, there was never any intention that it would affect legislation. So it was kind of one of those theoretical rights that you have, but not really a substantive right, at least for Indigenous women. However, we didn't give up. We had Sandra Lovelace, who hails from the Maritimes, hoot hoot, from the Tobik First Nation. She was a Maliseet woman and now a senator, a liberal senator in the Senate of Canada. She took Canada all the way to the United Nations. She won her case against Canada, not on the equality ground, but on Article 27 of uh, the Economic, Social, and Political, uh, I always get that mixed up. Anyway, there's an acronym for it. And, uh, Basically, it said that by her losing her status because she married a non-Indian and having to move off reserve, that meant that she wasn't able to enjoy her culture in community with her family and the rest of her community and her nation. And that, under international law, is illegal. The, the great thing about this case was that it was decided at the very same time that Canada had enacted its newly uh, empowered Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So Canada was going around the world saying, we have this great Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It protects equality for men and women. It would have been pretty hard at the United Nations or anywhere else to say, yes, we have this newly reinvigorated gender equality provision, but not for Indians. So they were forced to make an amendment to the Indian Act. Sadly, um, they chose not to address all of the gender discrimination and to include new forms of discrimination. So to make sure that even though they had to reinstate some Indigenous women, they could exclude a larger number so that the numbers would always continually be decreasing. They didn't want to have a scenario where anyone or any status Indians could increase. Which is why we have Sharon McIver, and I don't know how well you can see that, I'm, some of you must have heard about the McIver case. 
It got a lot more publicity than the previous cases. She's from BC. She challenged this. It took her 25 years to have her case heard. So there's lots of Indigenous women trying to address this issue. And the, uh, both the trial and BC Court of Appeals said that not by having two different kinds of status under the Indian Act, a greater one for males and a lesser one for me females is clearly gender discrimination. It clearly violates the Charter. So Canada responded by Bill C-3. Some of you might have heard that. That is now law for anyone who doesn't know. Um, and in typical Canada style, when they enacted Bill C-3, they arranged it such that there would be a small number of people who would be reinstated or get status for the first time, but a huge number of new people who would be excluded. So they created a new form of discrimination that wasn't already in the Indian Act. A discrimination based on family status and discrimination based on disability. Because in order to get the remedy under Bill C-3, you have to have kids. And you don't just have to have kids, you have to have non-status Indian kids. If you have status Indian kids, no remedy. If you have no kids, no remedy. In the Charter, that's discrimination based on family status, whether you have kids or not, and it could be disability. Think of the large number of people who can't have children because of, by birth, by death, or, or not by death, by accident, uh, by disease, or even by choice. How can your identity be determined based on whether or not you decide to have children, and with whom? So she, she appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada. She asked for leave to present her case to the Supreme Court of Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada denied her leave. So she's now before the United Nations. She has brought this case forward because despite the fact that Bill C-3 has been enacted, it doesn't even address her particular situation. So she's now on the international stage carrying this issue further, saying, you know, when are we going to deal with the gender inequality in the Indian Act? So we have this kind of vicious cycle of inequality, especially for Indigenous women, but I'll get to it later. It doesn't just affect Indigenous women anymore. It also affects our men and children. So we have Sandra Lovelace proves discrimination. Canada amends the Indian Act, but still leaves gender discrimination and creates new forms of discrimination. McIver proves discrimination, wins her case. So Canada amends the Indian Act still does gender discrimination and new forms of discrimination, always with the idea of reducing the number of Indians over time. So now we have McIver who has to take the very same case to the United Nations, and there's about 15 other cases working their way through the system. Lynn Gale on unstated paternity, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, Connie Perrone, Brenda Sanderson, Nathan McGilvery, Jeremy Matson. I mean, there's a large number, and they're all challenging different sections of the registration provisions of the Indian Act because they're still not being addressed. So why did I write my book? One, Canada controls our identities, and that's just plain wrong. No one group should control the identity of anybody else, ever, anywhere, at any time, for any reason. Indigenous women still do not have equality. The courts have recognized this. The United Nations has recognized this. Various reports from the United Nations have recognized this. Society recognizes this, but there's a lack of political will to change it because it means status Indian numbers would increase instead of decrease. And that conflicts with the overall a goal of assimilating Indians into Canadian society. That's, that's as simple as I can put it. The other issue I take in my book is not just gender inequality that it's clearly uh, um, inequitable for Indigenous women. But there's another issue that impacts our men and children, and that's what's called a notional blood quantum. So the Indian Act is based on the idea of reducing blood quantum over time, not actual blood. There's no blood test anybody in this room can take to prove that they're one-fifth or one-sixteenth or one-twenty-third. That's a fiction. That was disproven a hundred years ago when eugenics and phrenology, or you know, phrenol those pseudosciences were debunked. That just, it doesn't work that way. Identity has more to do with language, culture, history, community, that family, that kind of thing. So 
highlighting where the Indian Act comes from, what it's based on, to me is very key in gaining allies in society to say, well, yeah, we don't go around measuring people's races by blood. It doesn't work that way. Indigenous people aren't races. They're nations of people. They have their own political systems, their legal traditions, their governing systems. They're not an accident of birth. And that's a really key point to understand about the Indian Act. And the other thing for me, of course, I'm, I'm a professor and a lawyer, so sometimes lawyers think they know everything, not me, of course, um, is that knowledge is key to decolonizing our identities. I grew up with people saying, I am Mi'kmaq because of the blood that runs through my veins. My research helped me discover where do these ideas come from? Is that part of our culture? Are the, is this part of our traditions? And in studying the indigenous traditions all across the country, I couldn't find a single one that was based on any kind of racial category, color of skin, hair, eyes, curl of the hair, or blood. It was all based on normal identity indicators. And so what does this mean? Because the blood quantum rules under the Indian Act do have a very significant and profound end game if we don't do anything about it. Um, and then all of our allies here, any non-Indigenous people, you have an opportunity to be respectful allies, to put pressure on governments and corporations and businesses and politicians to change this. Here's what I mean. It's going to get a little bit confusing. I'm happy to answer 5,000 questions afterwards. If you think it's confusing and you don't understand it, imagine people who live under this regime. I have met very few status Indians who know what section they're registered under or why or what the implications are. Um, for me, of course, I, I didn't know that when I was getting married and having children. It's not like there was a, a Lava Life or a Match.com where you could fill in, I want a 6.1 Indian to make sure I end up with a 6.2 baby. It just didn't work that way. People didn't know what the effects of these sections were. I feel like I got shortchanged. Um, okay, so the way it works is Section 1 under the Indian Act, if you're registered under Section 1, that's considered the full status section, the 100% notional blood quantum, because it doesn't have anything to do with blood quantum in reality, that's why I call it notional. It's the idea that if you're registered under 6-1, you're a full breed Indian. Even if you're a non-Indian, you're now magically a full breed. 6-2 is what's called half status, <coughs> means what it says, you're considered 50%. What's the difference between the two? If you're a status Indian, isn't it the same? It's not the same. A 6-1 Indian can transmit their Indian status onto their children, regardless of who they have kids with. A 6-2 Indian can't. So already there's uh, inequality in different kinds of status Indians, and that has very significant implications. This 6-2 is what's referred to as the second generation cutoff rule. Because if you have less than 50% blood, like say 49.99999, you're what's considered an NSI, and that's not an FBI. That's an NSI, a non-status Indian. That's something you don't want to be if you want band membership, if you want to be able to live in your community. Canada calls this, not me, and that's why I put it in quotes, Canada calls this a one-quarter blood rule. So even though you don't see the term blood in the Indian Act anywhere, don't be fooled. Canada has said it's a one-quarter blood rule, and it's meant to eliminate Indians over time, that's Canada's words, and it's primarily for, quote, financial considerations, because you don't want to be paying for the education and health and housing of people. And I, and I will compare that with the situation in Canada in a minute. So where did this all come from? This is based on two different sciences. One is eugenics, the, the idea that you can create the ultimate human by, by breeding them in a certain way, and phrenology. So phrenology uh, was debunked a, a long time ago, where you measure the head, the cranium sizes of people to see if they're real Indians. <laughs> You, you stick a, pen, a pencil in their hair, and if they shake their head and it falls out, they're a native. And if it doesn't, they're African American. You check their teeth to see the color of their gums. You, you measure the color of their hair, the color of their eyes. All of these things which has nothing to do with identity over time. So 
this was based, in, it started out in early American policy, and it made its way up here because the colonizers were pretty much all the same here in the Northern uh, Hemisphere. And that was incorporated into legislation, both here in Canada and the United States. It's had a much more drastic impact on the United States, but it's having the same impact here. I'm going to explain this confusing math. It doesn't make sense. It's European math. <laughs> Not my fault. This is European math. So the way it works, notional blood quantum, is on the left-hand side for you is when Indians breed with other Indians, you create Indians. Different percentages of Indians, but Indians nonetheless. Once you start introducing a toxin like a non-Indian, you start losing your identity all of a sudden. You're considered diluted, and you're only two generations away from being legislatively extinct. You're like a walking dinosaur that nobody sees. You do not exist. So the way it works is, uh, the formula is pretty simple. A 6-1 plus a 6-1 equals a 6-1. But if you look at the very bottom, on all three levels, no matter which sections you mix, you can come up with different percentages, but at the end of the day, you end up as a 6-1. So you can be 100% 100%, or you can be a 75% 100%, or you can be a 50% 100%. But there's two kinds of 50% you don't want to, you do, there's two kinds of 50%. One is the 6-1 50%. That's the 100% 50% you want to be. You don't want to be a 50% 50%. Because that puts you in a different category, and that makes you a real half Indian as opposed to a full half Indian. <laughs> On the bottom, you'll see two 50%, so two halves equal a whole. <laughs> On this side, two quarters don't equal a half. When I talked about European math not making sense, again, this is not me, this is them. There's a reason why this math doesn't make any mathematical sense. It was never designed to create Indians, it was designed to eliminate Indians. You probably all remember hearing about uh, Duncan Campbell Scott's famous lines about make the, that federal Indian policy was to make sure that there was not a single Indian left in Canada. He wasn't the only one to say that. Every minister, every superintendent, everyone who worked on the Indian Act or legislative policy had as their number one goal to assimilate Indians in Canada. That has not changed or we wouldn't still have this under the Indian Act. Why is this offensive to me? So set aside the fact that these, are, these sections are applied unequally between men and women. I don't think democratic societies, any society, should be in the business of breeding human beings. I have three purebred dogs. You know what makes a purebred dog? When you breed them with other purebred dogs. I don't like being compared to a dog. I don't think any human being should be compared to a dog. You've got purebred dog registration. You apply to Indian Affairs for the same thing, purebred Indian registration. There's a problem with that in our society. During my research, I also looked up, well, what are other kinds of uh, entities that we breed for purity? And horses are something that there's a whole lot of criteria for how to breed pure blood horses. So to be a pure blood horse, a pure bred horse, you have to have breeding with other pure bred horses. So if you look at the other side here, to be a pure bred Indian, Indians have to breed with other Indians. Imagine if we were applying this to Canadian citizens. The goal of pure bred horses is to promote a true blood breed. Canada used to say that it was to uh, have a pure blood Indian. You've heard that many times, the authentic Indian. Now, what they call a pure blood Indian is an Indian who has genealogical proximity to the historical group of Aboriginal people that used to exist at one point in time. And that's a quote from the Sharon McIver court case. So the idea is that Aboriginal people used to exist at a certain point in time, pre-contact. Ever since that time, every generation who has been born since then has become less and less and less of a purebred Indian. I fear for Canadian citizens who existed at Confederation and how many generations of them have been born. 
I wonder if their citizenship should be uh, at risk. <laughs> but, but there's lots of other, I mean, there's lots of other really gross comparisons. And I do this for a reason, because to be a purebred horse, your head has to be a certain size. To be a purebred Indian, your head has to be noticeable for its roundness. Why well, wear hairspray? You can't tell what my head looks like. You can't judge me on my authenticity. Eyes for horses are most commonly brown. For phrenology and eugenics, Native Indians have to have brown eyes too, or you don't count. Imagine, I have one son with brown eyes and one with blue. Does that mean only one is, is uh, a Mi'kmaq person? What about the color of my skin? I don't know if it's the right shade. How many shades do I have to be? Imagine measuring people this way. Okay, so even if you think it's not that big of an issue, you know, determining people based on race, here's what happens if we do nothing. And I'm talking mostly to First Nations here. The majority of First Nations in this country have moderately high to very high out marriage rates. That means parenting with a non-Indian. A non-Indian under the Indian Act can be a Métis person, can be an Inuit person, can be another Indian, but just who can't get registration, or it can be any of the First Nation uh, groups in the United States. But if you're not registered, you're considered a non-Indian. If you combine those high rates of outmarriage with the second generation cutoff under the Indian Act, so parenting with non-Indians, you get predictable dates for when First Nations will be legislatively extinct. So Canada has done demographic studies, about 15 of them, to look at this issue, which First Nations have high outmarriage rates, and combine that with the status provisions under the Indian Act. And it doesn't matter which First Nation you are in this country, you have an extinction date. Unless the Indian Act is amended, you can look it up in the, in the study and say, oh, here's my First Nation, here's when it'll be legislatively extinct. My community, gone in 75 years. Some communities, gone in 35 years. Now, when I say gone, the people are still there. Our populations are actually increasing. We're learning our languages again. We're making all those connections to our communities and our culture, so we will be there physically. But Canada will not see us. What does that mean? Is it just a political thing? Is it just a social thing? No. If there's no legally recognized owner of reserve lands, for instance, there's a legal principle that says the land that has no legal owners sheets to the crown, which means now the crown owns it. In this case, the crown is the provincial government. So who stands to benefit if there are no more status Indians? Well, for reserve lands, it's the provincial crown. What about treaties? Treaties don't say anything about the Indian Act. They don't say anything about status. However, federal policy has determined that rightful treaty beneficiaries are those who are registered under the Indian Act. If there are no status Indians, I guess the treaty partner's gone. I guess the only half of the treaty that can walk around saying we're all treaty people would be Canadian citizens because their treaty partners would be gone in the eyes of Canadian law and Canadian policy. These are very, very significant issues because I don't know the exact words of every treaty across this country, but I know my peace and friendship treaties that we signed in the Maritimes say that all of the rights and benefits and protections and obligations in our treaties were for our heirs and heirs and heirs forever. When did forever stop in 75 years? When did our treaties give the right for Canada to decide when we don't exist anymore? To me, that's kind of a conflict of interest. When you get to decide when your contract partner doesn't exist anymore. Boy, that would be great if I could do that to my car dealer. Hey Ford, you don't exist anymore. Free car! <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, it's pretty serious. And it's not like it's not intentional. It is still federal policy today. So here's something that I pose to Canadians when I talk to them. Now this is a picture of a traditional Canadian. This is what an authentic, real Canadian looks like. You'll notice he's a white male 
somewhat large. He has blonde, I don't know if you call those curls or ripples or some kind of weird hair. And that would be his traditional regalia when he stands in judgment of others. He would be considered a very important man. So this is a traditional Canadian. What if Canadian citizenship was determined based on your remoteness or your closeness to the founding father of confederation? Yeah. And you have to be directly related to that founding father of confederation. You can't just be related to his cousin or uncle or mother or father or married in. <laughs> no. You must be related to that signatory. There would be no Canadian citizens today by Indian Act standards. They would have disappeared two generations after Fathers of Confederation. There would be no Canada. What if intermarriage between Canadian citizens and immigrants meant that it diluted your citizenship and you could no longer be a Canadian citizen? Wouldn't that be the most offensive kind of law to have in Canada? Talk about making sure that nobody interacted with anyone else. And if your town only has 40 or 50 people, that's slim pickings for dating. <laughs> the other question that I most often get from governments and corporations and those on the right-wing side of the spectrum is, okay, why do we want to increase the number of Indians? Well, like, we would have to pay for education and health care and things like that. So I say, okay, Canada's in a deficit. It's getting worse. Does that mean that next year we say, we're still in a deficit, we can't afford any more Canadians, no babies born in 2012 can be registered as Canadian citizens? Who determines their citizenship, their, their identity in a nation state based on whether or not you can pay for your people? No state does that. No state does that. No nation does that. No group does that. We never determined our identity based on whether or not there was lots of moose running around in the forest. <laughs> Mi'kmaq people never said, there's no moose today, you're out of here. Go join the Mohawks. No one did that. And similarly, no one said, there's lots of fish in the sea today, so we're going to exclude you so that we can save it all for ourselves, for this one family. Canada has tied finances to identity and made it a controversy in Canada so that people only see status as a financial grab so that they don't, they don't want to care that there's less and less status Indians and that amongst ourselves we don't want to welcome our members because oh my god we might have to give them a house. Now, mind you, I don't want a house without windows, with 18 people in it, that's full of mold and asbestos, has no running water and no sewer. So it's not like there's a big lottery to be had here. Status is about something more than housing. We pay for Canadian education. We pay for Canadian health. Why is it wrong for Indigenous people to want the same thing? It's not an increase in cost. It comes from a different pot. So the federal government gives money to the provinces to pay for Canadian citizens. Instead of giving the money to the provinces for health and education, they just pay directly to First Nations. Where's the increase in cost there? As, as non-status Indians were added to the cost of provinces, why does it matter who pays for health and education? That should not be a reason to deny our existence in the future. And the other thing I, I would say is, if, if the situation was reversed and we applied Indian Act rules to citizenship or even concepts of assimilation, so people like Alan Cairns and Tom Flanagan and Francis Widowson, and there's a whole host of them that say, you know, you guys drink Pepsi, you eat at McDonald's, you're assimilated. What if I turned the table and said, well, I married a non-Indian. I think I did a pretty good job of assimilating him. <laughs> I know some non-Aboriginal people that hunt and fish. Are they now Aboriginal? Have we assimilated them into our society? Why does it only work one way? Follow Bennett. 
Pardon me? I said I love Bannock. Yeah, but they, I am assimilated. You are assimilated, my friend. My money goes to the It, it, the, the reason why it sounds ridiculous and the reason why it doesn't make any sense when you talk about it for Canadian citizens is because it doesn't make any sense for us either. It's just that because it's only applied to Indians, a lot of people haven't cared for a very long time. It wasn't their problem. But don't forget, Indians are Canadians too. And what we do to one Canadian, we're doing to ourselves. And if we allow those kinds of double standards and different rules to apply to some Canadians, that's a very slippery slope for other issues that are coming down the pipe from the federal or provincial governments. And we can do better. We can do better than this. Why does it matter? Most people think status matters for money. Yay, I'm going to get some kind of financial benefit. I'm going to get rich off of treaty monies. I'm going to be supported for the rest of my life. Well, if anyone has read any of the statistics in the media lately, First Nations are the most impoverished communities in this country. Not just a little bit either. On the United Nations Human Development Index, which measures things like lifespan, health, education, employment, all the things that um, someone would look at to live a good life. Canada ranks number four in the world. Wow. No wonder other countries think Canada is so great. When you just measure the conditions of First Nations people in this country, Canada slips to 78, below South American countries, below third world countries. So when we walk around and, and we look at other countries and what we have to do to fix things in other countries, well, First Nations here are 78th in the world. We've got some work to do right here at home. And we're all one country. This is all of our responsibility. This isn't a matter of, hey, status <coughs> Indian, pull up your socks. I did it, uh, you can do it. Yeah, you may have done it, but you did it off of our land, off of our resources, off of our opportunities that weren't afforded to us. People say, why do status Indians, some status Indians live on welfare? Why don't they go out and work? Imagine if someone was to come to your house and say, you can't leave your uh, 24 hectares of land with you and your, I don't know, 20 neighbors. You need a pass to go on and off your little piece of property. There's nothing on your land. There's no animals. You can't hunt them. You can't work anywhere. There's only a few people. But we will support you because we've, we've put you there. So we'll just give you little rations, just enough to sustain you, just barely enough for multiple generations. And then people say, now that those laws don't apply, well, pull up your socks. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Those inequalities have been in place for so long, you're not even at the same starting point. You cannot compare someone without an education, without running water, with someone who has an education and who has connections in the business community and whose uncle knows someone who knows someone <coughs> on the Supreme Court of Canada who can get you a job and who owns 500 acres of prime real estate in downtown Vancouver. Well, of course they can make their way. Of course. They have all of the opportunities, all of the land and resources that we used to have our governments and all of our prosperity on. Can I just get to questions sure. in a second? Yeah, because I'm just about done here. So that's just the economic side of things. There's a whole lot of other reasons why status under the Indian Act is important if it's going to be in existence. A political voice. Non-status Indians don't have one. The majority of non-status Indians are Indian women and all their children and their, and their grandchildren. So we're denying a voice to a whole segment of uh, First Nations and Métis populations. You don't get to vote in elections, you don't get to run in elections, you don't get to have a say in your community, you don't get to negotiate self-government. I don't want to participate in a self-government agreement 40 years from now, I want to have a say now. I don't want my status 40 years from now. I don't want my kids to get their status 40 years from now. There's legal rights, the right to live on reserve. It's still the law that only Indians can occupy land on reserve. Only Indians can be on reserve. So you can't live on reserve unless you're an Indian. You can't pass on your land. So let's just say your parent has 100 acres on a reserve land under a certificate of possession. They can't leave it to you in your will if you're not a status Indian. It has to go to someone else. 
even if that land's been in your family for generations. Culture is the biggest part. Access to your elders, your language, your community, uh, uh, activities, your traditions, your customs, the whole governing system, um, being able to contribute to your community, to build it up, to make sure nations will be stronger in the future, all of that is denied under the Indian Act. And then personal. For some people, being a status Indian, being a band member, is a very important part of their identity because it's the only one that's recognized right now. Because it's the only way to access hunting rights and fishing rights and all of the things that you've done traditionally. That's why it matters for us. And a survey was done in, back in 1985 when the first amendments were made to reinstate some uh, Indian women back to status about what is the number one reason why you want your status back. Economic reasons were the last. The number one reason was to be band members again, to be able to live or participate in their community and their culture, to be welcomed back, to be acknowledged that they are just as Mi'kmaq or Mohawk or Cree or Maliseet as anybody else in their community. That was the number one reason. Contrary to popular belief, it wasn't money. And it's hard to reassimilate once they've left it. So that's kind of when I come around and, and speak to people, some people expect a book reading. My book isn't very poetic, so I don't have any like nice metaphorical stories to tell in my book. I can't flip to the pages and, and do that kind of you know, book reading style of stuff. I'm more of a little soapbox person <laughs> about why everybody should join in changing these issues. So the way my book is laid out, there's an introduction. What the introduction is, is my family history. My grandmother who married out and lost her status, which meant my father didn't have his status and I didn't. Yet, had my grandmother been my grandfather, he would have had status, his non-Indian wife would have had status, my father would have had status and I would have had status my whole life and so would my kids now. But because she was a woman, we were excluded. That's a struggle. And that has had a very serious impact. The first section, so once you read the introduction, you might think, oh, this is easy reading. Then you get to chapter one, and then you realize, okay, yeah, she is a boring lawyer. So I talk about legislation, I talk about the amendments, I talk about what each of those sections mean. So it can be a little hard to plug through, but it, if, if you have any questions, email me. Call me. I, I get lots of questions. The second and third chapters are related. Because there's this concept that's uh, played out in, in academia, in policy, in public discourse, in the media, that this issue is really about pitting Indigenous women against their communities. And it's not. Because Indigenous identity can't be considered separately. There's no nation that exists without its individuals. And individuals can't identify with a Mohawk nation if there's no Mohawk nation. So one depends equally on the other. This isn't pitting people against people. The Indian Act has done that. The media has done that. Society has done that, has portrayed us as, this is about women against communities. This is about communities against other communities. This is about leaders against their citizens. How often do we see First Nations leaders vilified in the media? That's for a very, very, very specific purpose. It's called divide and conquer. That's not rhetoric. That's how the Indian Act has been set up over time. We had huge nations divided into little first nations, then subdivided. Then you divide the families, and then you divide the men and women, and then you take the citizens and make them hate their leaders, and make everyone think that they're alone in this struggle, when in actual fact we're all in it together. And part of decolonization is realizing where all of this comes from, recognizing the problem, and forgiving ourselves for being colonized. So when someone looks at me and says, oh, well, you're just a new status Indian, I forgive them. Because that's not them talking. That's not the Mohawk talking. That's colonization talking. And they're at a different point of decolonization than I am. So part of my goal is to bring decolonization as a, as a way of our thinking. Um, 
So these two chapters, one, I truly believe it's the Indigenous nations' right to determine who they are. It's not Canada's right. At the same time, chapter three says, individuals have a right to belong to their nations, free from being discriminated against because of our gender, or because of our alleged blood quantum or the color of our hair. Luckily, we women have hair dye, so that shouldn't be too much of a problem. But for others, can't do much about eye color. Well, I guess you can now with contacts, but. Um, and then the fourth chapter, which might seem a little bit unrelated, I compare band membership to self-government citizenship. Because many band, the majority of band codes, band membership codes in this country are determined by Canada. There's about a third who have their own band membership codes, and a majority of those just follow the Indian Act provisions. Not much of a point in having a band membership code. Self-government citizenship was supposed to be the solution, and like I said at the very beginning, it has done the very same thing. Except in self-government citizenship codes, you see the words, you must be one quarter ancestry. So instead of using more modern terms, they're now reverting back to the uh, concept of blood. Those are the things that we, we kind of need to point out. Uh, and then the conclusion, which goes back to the easy reading. So basically what my eight sisters and three brothers have done is read the first and last chapters and attended my session so they could hear about the rest. <laughs> That's okay if you do that too. Um, so in addition to talking about my book ceaselessly in hopes that people will understand the issue that I'm talking about, I'm on... I have my own website, I have my own blog, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, all that social media stuff, uh, to try to access the largest number of people, the largest number of youth I possibly can to help inform people in different ways. And so obviously I don't just talk about this issue, I talk about all the different uh, issues in our community. And um, this is what I teach, so imagine my poor students. They get this political rant every time they come to class. I have them almost completely brainwashed. And that is my goal. By teaching non-Indigenous people who are going to be the future lawyers, prime ministers, ministers, what should be, what shouldn't be, then hopefully they'll make better decisions in the future than their parents did. That being said, there's a large number of really respectful allies we have in this country anti-poverty groups that work with us, indigenous women's groups, environmental groups, students, interested people. And what we're trying to do is increase that number because we have the power to put pressure on government to make change. It's pretty hard for less than 4% of the population to do that alone. And seeing as we're partners in this whole business, seeing as some of us 4% have successfully assimilated, some of you, we were, we're kind of hoping for your contributions. Oh, okay, so I'm not going to explain this chart, but it will be on the web. It's very confusing, so I only flash it up there. It basically compares what Indian status was pre-85, post-85, and now. Very complex, so let this sink in for a little bit. If it seems ridiculous, it is. And if you have any specific questions about status or this presentation or any of the issues I covered in my book, happy to stay here for 10 hours and answer all of your questions, subject to the public library kicking me out sometime. <laughs> so that's my, my rant. Anybody who wants to ask any questions, I'm always happy for trick questions too. Yep. After uh, 14 years with this individual, and if you were to stand her in a court of law or anything else like that, you know, people get descriptions, oh, there's a white man, a black man, or whatever. There's no doubt about it, she's native. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's church or what have you. Now, she has to go through all the books and everything to maintain her status. What brought it to it was, again, your you know, simulation part. But now her children, you know, of course, they want rights, and now that they're in their 20s, right? Uh, now they're reviewing this, and they want as part of their status, but for them to back up their own family tree when they were in different schools and things like that, and they are given different names, and now they have to go through all these chapters and unfold this. She's been struggling with this for years and years. When if all you have to do is stand her up there, I mean, you got a white doll, or you got a black doll, or you got a native doll, I mean, all you got, I, you know, I use it for humor, but it's seriousness, stand yourself in front of a judge and say you're not a native. 
and yet she's going through the struggle for her status through all the government documents when it is all apparent. So why, why, and going back to the 80s, like you said, no, I just parachuted into this, right? And take this with humor again. Cowboys and Indians, eh? Now here, 14 years with this lady, and she's struggling for her status for her children. Now, how, how, yeah. uh, how does this come about that she has such a struggle when it is so her apparent? Okay, because the number one purpose of the Indian Act is not to create Indians. <coughs> it's not meant to be easy. If they can find a way to make sure you don't get registered or acknowledged, they will. So there's lots of other problems under the Indian Act, like unstated paternity. If you don't state who the father is under the Indian Act, your child will not be registered or registered under a lesser status. That's in litigation. With regards to your comment, what my book is arguing is that we shouldn't be looking at people and determining what their identity is because that's a racist idea of who someone is based on what they look like, their skin color, their hair color. What I'm saying is that indigenous nationhood, like any other nation in the world, is about your governance structure, your laws, your economies, your histories, your ancestors, your culture, your language. And I don't care what you look like. Exactly. It's, it's not about that. Years, yeah. uh, I do not profess to speak it, but I understand Cree and Sony yeah. and everything. She doesn't even barely understand a word of it, yeah. yet she, she came. And the other part that, about your yeah, question yeah, is that uh, the registration process is very long and complex, and the obligation sure. is on the applicant to provide all of the information to the satisfaction of Indian Affairs. Their criteria for what evidence to accept and what doesn't is based on policy, not law. When the church Just, down and the went with it. Yeah, I know, I've got to get to lots of other questions I know, but too. I know, I'm yeah. The struggle she's gone through. I know, and there's the lots of people across the country that have this similar struggle because unstated paternity, not registering children because you don't name the father, that's not a law. <coughs> That's not in the Indian Act. That's a policy choice by Canada. So these things are being challenged in the courts. So someone else must have a, a real doozy question. Yeah? Sorry, I, I, I'm kind of new to this whole uh, situation. But I, why is it so important that you are recognized by the government? Like, for example, I'm German ancestry, but I don't feel like that's, like I, I take pride in that. And I feel like that's part of the reason you want is just allow other people to take pride in the same thing. Like what is your ideal point you'd say where you say this is a successful system? It's a good question. <coughs> Do you want your Canadian citizenship to be recognized in Canada and in other countries? Yes. Do you want it to be legally enforceable so that you can get back across the border when you go to Cuba? Yeah. You need it to access health to drive on our roads to uh, access education. It's that fundamental to First Nations in this country because it's not just about accessing health and education. In order for you to access treaty rights, in order for you to be recognized as a government and govern yourself, you have to be recognized as a status Indian in Canada. I don't think we should be aspiring to be status Indians. I'm all about identifying as a Mi'kmaq person and a Mi'kmaq citizen of my nation and building my nation that way. But there's legal and political impediments to moving that way outside of Canada's legal structure. It's pretty hard to get Canada to sit down and acknowledge our right to be self-determining if they don't think we exist. So it's that fundamental. No different than citizenship. Imagine if you went to Cuba and tried to come back and Canada said, you're not a citizen, you're German. You're intermixed somewhere. It would be devastating to citizens to, to have insecurity of citizenship. And this is what we're talking about, insecurity of identity and citizenship. We never know from day to day when we're going to lose it. My grandmother went from a Mi'kmaq person to a status Indian to a non-status Indian back to a status Indian but a lesser status Indian. What other group in society gets their citizenship, loses it, gets it, loses it, gets it, loses it? have to move out of Canada, oh, you get to move back in. Oh, but you don't get the benefits, and we won't let you live in the province of Saskatchewan. That would cause havoc. That would, that would cause a lot of social problems. Yeah? Hi. First of all, I'd like to welcome you to Cree country. Woohoo! <laughs>
but um, I actually went, uh, did my post-secondary in College of Commerce, University of Saskatchewan, but, you know, I got a lot of flack just from, you know, being called free rider, the mm -hmm. whole, mm -hmm. you know, other than the usual, but um, you're right, I really, I, we needed, to, that's the type of uh, studies we need in a classroom, because that's something that's being ignored. And, you know, lots of new immigrants coming into Canada, they're not, they don't have any clue. They just know, oh, those are the free riders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a concept I find hard to understand to free ride on your own land. Exactly. <laughs> it's kind of like asking your brother who stole your bike if you can ride just a little bit of your bike. <laughs> like, all of this stuff doesn't make sense, but it's for people to understand it. When you've grown up, that's your history courses, that's what you've learned in school. You know what I learned in grade six? That Indians died out a long time ago. Exactly. And there was no such thing as treaties. And I was like, whoa, do I even exist in this classroom? I mean, that's how fundamental it is. Imagine telling a child you don't exist. Well, it just, you know, the latest, uh, anything that's tied to our, the latest in, uh, to our, to our identity anyway, we, we get a, we now get an Indian status card. Oh, it's been for five years. Then you need to get it. Really, you expire in five years. Yeah. Yes. It expires in five years. Yeah. And I thought, yeah, I might be dead before my car. You know? Exactly. Wow. Imagine if Canadian citizenship expired five years. Exactly. The amount of money they would make on fees, <coughs> renewing citizenship alone. Uh-huh. Imagine and, not just that Canada made those laws, but we as First Nations are going to impose those laws on Canadians. But if anything, you know, that those dollars that we have to pay to get a new picture, to, to get an updated picture, those revenues should be coming into our pot. It goes into someone else's pot. Yeah. So you had a question earlier, and I don't want to forget you unless I already answered it. Okay, thanks, <laughs> thanks Dr. Finn. Um, I had a question when you were showing the slide about why does status matter. And approximately four out of six of those items have to do with recognition within the Aboriginal community itself to achieve a citizenship code. Uh, for example, the right to live on reserve, access to elders, a source of identity and mm -hmm, belonging, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. etc. A couple of them are more economic in nature that deal with the first. Ta yeah, tax benefits, etc. So my thinking was that when you're going through this slide is how important it is for your talk to educate and decolonize Aboriginal people themselves. Because if you try to achieve agreement on those topics, on reserve, is really, really difficult. And um, I'm, I'm glad that your audience is both you know, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, because a lot of work needs to be done in the Aboriginal community, not just the non-Aboriginal community. And I'm sure that's part of your tour and your lecture. Oh yeah, and it's like when I meet with First Nations, it's a very different conversation because the right to live on reserve isn't determined by First Nations. That's Canada. So I'm not going, you know, there's nothing I can say to a First Nation where that's all kind of incorporated under the Indian Act. The things that can be changed are things like whether or not we include those like non